now. Well, today we have uh, James Heathers on the Akkad and Cocoa Report. We're very uh, uh, honored uh, that James uh, will give us some of his uh, time uh, to do this. Um, James, is a, James Heathers is a full-time research scientist, author, consultant at no Northeastern University in Boston in a computational beho behavioral science lab. He did his undergraduate work in psychology and industrial relations from the University of Sydney and went on to get his PhD in uh, methodological improvements in heart rate variability at the same institution. Um, he finished this up in 2015, worked as a research fellow in the Department of Cardiology in Poland before arriving at his current job as a postdoc in Northeastern, where he's been since 2016. He loves cats, tweets that handles at James Heathers, and co-hosts a podcast that's very funny called Everything Hurts, Hurts spelled H-E-R-T-Z, where he uh, frequently rants about data science. <laughs> he is... That was ideal. Well done. <laughs> you've, you've nailed it, sir. Good job. He is most famous, however, for everything that isn't found on his CV. He is a self-described data thug. I, I was going to wear my skull cap um, in, in honor, but um, oh, nice. it, didn't, it, it was going to mess up my hair. So. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> uh, so he's a self-described data thug, a modern-day Sherlock Holmes who spends his weekends and evenings exposing shoddy and questionable research. I and much of the world first heard of him surrounding the cur curious case of Cornell researcher Brian Wansink. Brian, I don't know how to pronounce his name. Wansink? Wansink. Wansink. Wansink had been director of Cornell's Food and Brand Lab, which is an international, well, at least U.S. famous uh, lab, where he had gained a national reputation uh, as a, a world-renowned eating behavior expert. He was an expert because his work has been cited more than 20,000 times, and it focuses on how environment shapes how we think about food and what we end up consuming. His research has led many big food companies to offer smaller snack packaging, and his work is, was frequently catnip for the media. Um, exciting work you've probably heard of, like attractive names sustain increased vegetable intake in schools. So things were going swimmingly for um, uh, Dr. Juan Sink. He's well-funded by seemingly everyone, king of the world. And then he wrote a blog post in 2016 giving advice on how to do research. Um, we'll have the link um, uh, in, in the show notes. It essentially was a plea for postdocs, advice to postdocs, to take data sets and torture them until significant results were obtained. The comment section on this blog is, are somewhat hilarious. Uh, there are many, of them, <laughs> many of them ask. I know about this. half of those people. <laughs> <laughs> many of them ask if this was satire. Um, this was, but that wasn't the main problem uh, for him. Uh, this was like waving a red flag to some bulls. These bulls, um, a, a group uh, uh, that James is a part of, um, Tim Van Der Zee and Jordan Anaya and Nick Brown, all started looking at the papers published out of his lab and began discovering all sorts of impossibilities. Um, so this is, this is also where the man who speaks Australian made his uh, own entrance. Um, just to remind you, the study in question demonstrated that changing the names of carrots in school cafeterias to something cool like x-ray vision carrots uh, would make the kids eat more. Um, so James, tell us, tell us what, what happened when you uh, gave your uh, perusal of this particular uh, paper. I'll tell, I'll tell you how it started. It's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a funny story. And yeah. when, when it started off... I bought alone, tried to stop it. And the reason why is extremely prosaic. Um, I think it was Jordan originally who read this blog post and said, this can't, this, this can't be good. But someone who describes this kind of research practice, there, there must be, there must be so many problems dwelling in this research record. And Jordan and Nick and Tim had never heard of this guy, didn't know his research, did no sort of no positive feelings, no negative feelings. He was just a name on a page. And I did the first half of a master's in exercise physiology, which you didn't put into my bio there. Oh dear, the attention to detail, <laughs> sir, how dare you. But uh, that, research, that research came up. Uh, I'd read one of his books years ago, and the studies were really, really simple. They're really simple things. Change the name of this. Children put more carrots in face. Done. 
end of story. And the first thing that I said, uh, which looks marvelously silly in retrospect was, oh, I don't think there'll be anything there. I don't, I, I, I can't, I didn't have the imagination to think that you could get research that that's, uh, that's that simple, that wrong, which is, is, is something that's obviously colored the subsequent years of me thinking about how other people think about research, but separate story. Um, that was, that was my first reaction. Oh, come on. Look, how, how could you possibly get that wrong? I'm sure it's fine. I, I, I have some intimation of the background of what's going on here. I'm, I'm sure it's probably okay. Um, having no preconceptions whatsoever, everyone else said bullshit. Um, absolutely no. On the basis of the available evidence, we should start looking. And they started looking. And they were using a test. I hesitate to call it a test, but I suppose it is a test that we came up with, which is very simple. If you Google it, it's called GRIM, which stands for granularity related, uh, granularity related inconsistency of means. It's an extremely simple observation. Um, I, was, uh, I was full of hesitation when we published it. I thought the maths in this is trivial. Everyone's going to yell at me for being a bad mathematician. And eventually we got the reviews back and they say, could you make it slightly less mathematical because it's confusing? Whew, okay, so, sigh of relief. I've not lost the plot completely. But the, the observation is very simple. If you have 17 people in a sample or a patient cohort and they are reporting some answer that is reported in scale units, rate your pain from one to 10, right? Um, rate your depression on these items, which ends up being from zero to 20. And you have a threshold or you have a, uh, a top group or a bottom group. That's uh, something you shouldn't do, but that's beside the point. When it comes to your 17 people, you will be returned a sum of scores and the sum of scores will be divided by 17, which means that your mean should be in 17ths. That's it. That's the whole, that's the secret source. That's the end of the story. So if someone is reporting a mean and it's not in 17ths, if you say, ah, oh, we found the mean and it's 3.85, you think, hang on a second. You can't make that in units of 17. The number that's reported is not consistent with the nature of the observation. At which point in time you start thinking, hmm, okay, what are the reasons for this? Could be a typo, could be the fact that you've lost some data, um, could be something that's in the wrong line, because as everyone knows, journals are marvelous with typesetting and never make mistakes. <clears throat> um, but it could also be the fact that you just don't really care about whether or not everything's accurate and well comported when you put the paper together. There are extensions of that test that go into uh, significantly more statistical territory, but I know most of your audience are doctors, so let's put a pin in that. <laughs> if you want to read about it, you're going to have to Google it. Suffice to say, that test and all its friends and cousins goes out into this literature and finds a problem after problem after problem after problem. And that culminated in Jordan, Nick and Tim, not me, I'm still mostly uninvolved at this point, publishing a paper that was about the research described in that blog post and just how many errors there were. They stopped counting when they found 150 numbers that couldn't exist. That's not to say there's 150 errors, that's just where they stopped counting. And the fact is if you have two things and they're mutually inconsistent, you don't know which one's which and you have something else that's supposed to be consistent with one of those, you end up with some kind of weird infinite regress of nothing working. The papers were disasters. Yeah. So, um, some, so something like, for instance, uh, there was a table that described carrots eat, carrots taken, carrots eaten, and carrots that uh, were not eaten. And obviously, the carrots eaten plus the carrots not eaten should presumably equal the carrots taken. And just simple things like that were yeah, incorrect. Right, right. Right. We we have a noun. We do something to it, or we don't. Therefore, we have a total. Okay. That's, I'm pretty sure I learned that when I was four. Now, for an observation like that, yeah, obviously you've, you've, you've read it. That's perfectly straightforward. The thing that people don't get about 
uh, about something. But you, we, so you say that and everyone thinks, oh, that's, that's, that's trivial. Obviously, that's not the case. Um, we found that paper on ResearchGate. It had been viewed, I don't know how many times. I can't actually remember if it was 1,100 or 11,000. I'll say 11,000, but feel free to fact check that if anyone's uh, that sufficiently concerned. But it's been in the literature for a very long time. It's been read by a very large amount of people and no one ever noticed that if you've got two sub-means of one group, then they're supposed to add up to the same number. We are, we are not talking about proper combinatorics here. This is not hierarchical linear modeling. <laughs> this is not the Riemann hypothesis. This is, does A plus B equal, open brackets, A plus B, close brackets. It's some really complicated stuff. Now, if that's the kind of detail that's being missed, the question is immediately posed, what lies beneath? And then, you know, there's a, a year of my life follows that that I'll never get back. But the one, the one fun thing, the one sort of collectively useful thing that it did lead to amongst the, I think, 50 or so papers that we managed to collectively assess. Um, fun side point, uh, a lot of Professor Wansink's work has been retracted now. A lot of that work that has been retracted had nothing to do with us whatsoever. That was motivated editors and journals going out into the world and saying, I think there's a collective problem with these papers. Can you justify results A through K? And they had some interaction I'm not familiar with and then all the papers went away. A lot of those had nothing to do with us whatsoever. It's just the fact that it started, it started a skeptical process, which was very obviously warranted considering what happened because no journal wants to retract everything. You don't make any money, you look bad, it takes ages. Um, why, why, would, why would they want to? Well, they might want to improve the quality of scientific discourse. <laughs> that might be a concern, but it might be a concern that's way down the line after uh, I need the amount of work provided by editing this journal to remain something that allows me to maintain my life on a sensible level. There's an awful lot of checking that needs to be involved in uh, trying to remove a paper from public record. So he said, getting himself off track. Uh, 50, 50 papers later, um, something that I was particularly interested in was another test that came out of this procedure. And it's, it's the fact that if you report a mean and a standard deviation and a sample size, there's only so many ways that you can fit them together and have them work. Now, the vast majority of them that are reported in research papers um, are probably accurate descriptions of real data. Now, some of them are not. So how do you find out if they aren't? One of the best ways is to say, if our mean and standard deviation are mismatched somehow. If I say I have a very large sample of something that's supposed to be well spread out and a very small amount of deviation, what could that data look like? So the process of coming up with that ended up in a test called Sprite. Sprite is basically an algorithm that makes decisions very, very quickly about what can and can't exist in an iterative process for numbers to exist within a sample. So if you have something like, say we're rating something from one to seven, we end up with a mean of three and a standard deviation of three and a half. If you see that on a piece of paper, you do not immediately visualize the distribution in your mind unless you're a weirdo like me. What you do see is something that is vaguely reasonable, but it's not. It's not. If you try to reconstruct it, the best possible solution for something that you can get like that is a huge amount of ones and a huge amount of sevens all at the same time. So details like that can exist behind the veil of the numbers. And it's a process for being able to recreate how those samples might exist in the first place. Now, that turned out to be a really, really good tool for these papers. 
And some of the really famous central planks of the whole food and brand research regime thing have reported data that is really impossible, really actually properly impossible. Where did it come from? I still have no idea. We just know that it, it, it's very, very unlikely that it can exist the way that it's described. Right. So, so in, in your paper, you know, getting back to the carrot paper, um, where uh, uh, the thought was that if you have um, a uh, uh, name the carrot in some special way, like you call them maroon five carrots or x-ray vision carrots, um, if you just have that as the label in the school cafeteria, the kids will eat more carrots. Uh, right. So they had this study where they compared control, car- you know, control just you know carrots uh, named carrots and uh, extra vision carrots, and they looked at um, you know and uh, they looked at it and found that you know obviously kids were eating more extra vision carrots, but uh, you know you you very nicely point out um, that I- I- in the control arm there um, there was a mean of nineteen point four, a standard deviation of nineteen point nine, an n of forty five. And when you went back and tried to recreate the plausible data sets that could give you that type of result, you, you came up with something pretty, pretty amusing. What, do you remember what you, what you found? <laughs> ah, yes. Um, ob- obviously, I know. I was there. But <laughs> very few people listening will be familiar with this one. This is hilarious. If you have a mean of about 20, and a standard deviation of about 20, and you have about 45 participants. The question is posed, obviously you have a distribution that has to be right-tailed. You can't eat negative carrots, that would be someone extracting carrots from you. That would be a job for a gastroenterologist with a really weird hobby. (laughs) Not gonna happen, especially not in a school. So, Presumably you could eat no carrots, some kids hate vegetables, presumably you could eat some carrots, but mean of 20, standard deviation of 20, 45 people in the sample. So we put that through Sprite and we go through hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of iterations. And the minimum, the absolute minimum in a really weird, odd distribution, the minimum value for the hungriest child is about, I think, 55. A reasonable value is about 60. Children don't eat 55 carrots unless they're thoroughbreds <laughs> or a donkey or an elephant. There's no child that eats right. 55 So carrots. one thing didn't mention the fact that he was doing this in a school of horses, Clydesdale horses. Yeah, yeah, the, the Clyde, and you'd think that the Clydesdale part was particularly important. So you know, you, he's, he's obviously read my blog post. It outlines the Clydesdaleish nature of this particular observation. Um, it turned, that actually had, I'm still not sure about how that shook out. As far as I'm aware, I think that paper's gone. But uh, as far as I'm aware, one thing that they neglected to mention was that these were not baby carrots, even though they look, there's a promo video where they're describing them. They've got a big bowl of baby carrots. They go, look at these carrots. And I go, oh, yeah, okay, carrots. Forgive me for taking you at your word. It turns out they were matchstick carrots. Um, so that's what one thing said in response. One thing uh, said. Um, then, of course, I mean, the thing that immediately happens after that is you try to figure out how a lunch lady is counting out 42 matchstick carrots while serving children who are coming along in the traditional line with the cafeteria tray. I'm pretty sure she left her, her, her micrometer at home. Um, so, I mean, it, it explains one thing, but a bit opens up another, opens up another vista of uh, facts that can't be explained. So uh, that's a very typical example of how the kind of practical observations and the observations about data can be combined. Right. Now, I've seen, I've, I've, I've seen this is, this is not somehow specific to nutritional science, um, especially if there are people out there who doctors are the best for these sorts of observations. And I'll tell you why, because you understand the intimate details of what data means in context when it's being collected. So I've had people say something to me like, oh, they had that many renal patients in a hospital that size over that period of time? I don't believe it. 
That's not an observation that I can make. Someone has to tell you to look into something like that. But those are, because of the contextual elements involved, I think doctors make observations like that the best because it's so specific. It also doesn't have the kind of general nature of, uh, if, say, if you're doing social science research, you've got, I went out and got 100 undergraduates, uh, rolled them into a lecture hall and gave them a questionnaire. Well, yeah, like anything goes. But when it, comes, when it comes to people who've got specific conditions in specific contexts, in specific places, yeah, you can, you can make some really interesting observations. And by interesting, I mean terrifying. So you're, you're hurting us. So you're going to request us busy clinician doctors to do more than read the abstract. <laughs> um, oh, wow. <laughs> I wish I could remember a time where I got to read the abstract. <laughs> oh, so, dear. <laughs> <laughs> that feels like a few years ago. So, so the end result of all the work that, you know, uh, that you folks did, um, you know, you, you kind of piled on at the end with Sprite and, uh, uh, you know, your fellow... Uh, your, your, your fellow uh, warriors in, in arms, if you will, um, you know, uh, d did a bunch of work as well. It ultimately resulted in uh, Dr. Wansink having to step down from this post. So he's no longer, I understand he's no longer at Cornell, or he's not, no longer at Cornell in that capacity, certainly. And, and as you've said, a number of those papers have been um, retracted. So the question that's been asked by a lot of critics, James, is that have you destroyed, and again, a lot of this work that you've been doing, because you're in this field, is in the world, in, in, in the field of psychology, correct? Um, I suppose so. I'm, I'm more familiar with it than um, other social scientific areas, but it has a kind of a nexus around that. I'm not really a psychologist, not, right. not anymore. Right, um, right. So most, most of my job's not really like that, but yeah, that's fair to say. So have you, dis and, and so, you know, psychology pa papers similar to this um, about things like, uh, you know, are men less likely to assist women who tie up their hair? Um, you know, papers, uh, studies like this used to end up on the front pages of, of some rag or the other. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and, and now, uh, you know, there's been a, a whole uh, amount of doubt cast on this. So have you destroyed a once ascendant field that used to grace the covers of all sorts of magazines? Mm, it's hard to assign responsibility for something <laughs> like that. But if, it's, if, if that's the right verb, then I've certainly played a part. But I mean, I'd think about it this way. I mean, if you, if you had a house that was a beautiful heritage house, and the foundations were completely gone and there's absolutely nothing you can do. And if someone went inside it, pieces of it would fall on their head. And you went and knocked it down because there was absolutely nothing whatsoever supporting the upper floors because it was dangerous. People would spend a lot of money maintaining it. If you knock that down, are you a wrecker? Is that a, is that a destructive act or is that a kind of a necessary correction to the fact that something is expensive, dangerous, misleading. Yeah. So the, the, people don't like elements of this for a couple of reasons. Um, one is probably in general with the way some of it needs to be conducted because you, you have to understand the context here. If you have a public reputation for criticizing research, people bring you the worst possible stuff that is available. You hear and see the worst possible stories that are under the hood, right? The, the real magician behind the curtain. You get to see how the sausage is made quite a lot. Um, I have helped people in one version or another dealing with problems in biopsych, ecology, proper lab biology, uh, a, a variety of medical fields and subfields. A lot of people just want advice. They just want the story to be heard, etc. People, people write to you. Mm. And that ends up becoming your perspective. That ends up being what you deal with. You don't go out and uh, open your favorite journal and see what's being published today and see that most of it, most of it is essentially useful at some level, we hope. It's essentially accurate. It's offered in good faith, certainly. But you don't see the stuff that 
gets emailed to me. And a lot of the time it's impossible to discuss because you can't imagine the world of hurt that you could open yourself up to if you, if you go off on something like that. You can't, just, you can't just start emailing people and going, hey, so uh, how about that fraud, eh? You, you can't do that. It is too important. It has to be handled carefully. There are too many layers and you're talking about someone's livelihood and reputation. It is not something that you can be cavalier with. So all I can really tell you about the things like that that are ongoing is there are things happening behind the curtain that would make most people really uncomfortable. Mm. So this is just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, there's, there's really some uncomfortable stuff and you're just exposing, uh, exposing stuff that's incredibly egregious, you'd say. When it's, when it's possible, yeah. yeah. See, imagine, imagine the following scenario, which is cobbled together from a few other possible scenarios, right? You're a grad student working in a lab. We'll make this medical specific or everyone's going to ignore the example. All right, you're a grad student working in a lab. It's somewhere in biomedicine somewhere you directly witness something that you see where research is performed and it's performed really, really badly. And by badly, I mean either uh, observations that are inconvenient are neglected to be recorded. Data magically changes from one day to the other. Or whole tranches of data are simply disappeared or new numbers appear or ratings that are done subjectively just happen to give you the results you want. You work for someone. You may have a visa that that is basically the center of your livelihood that means you work for someone. You can't start writing letters to your MP. You can't call your member of Congress, march through the dean's door and bang the the folder on the table like you're the paper editor in Spider-Man. You are exposed. And you don't want to make anything worse. And in an environment like that, you look around for like, who the hell can I talk to? No one knows what COPE is. There you are. What's COPE? Do you know what COPE is? No. that, that That is absolutely perfect. You've obviously done a good amount of background research to do this episode. And you're, you're a smart man with a podcast that is specifically about (laughs) problems in research and you don't know what COPE is. There's a committee on publication ethics. They uh-huh. handle, they handle, there's uh, people who are signatories to it, et cetera, et cetera. That nice, way, you, can, you, can, you can Google that. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not picking on you. What I'm saying is they have no profile by which someone in that situation could say, will anybody help me? Will anybody look at the problem that I'm seeing? Because the other thing that happens is you end up with this weird kind of gaslighting business going on. I see these problems. Does no one else see these problems? I feel like I'm going crazy. I feel like there's, there's something missing here. I cannot tell you how many instant messages, Twitter DMs, uh, emails, whatever else I've answered where someone's going, just check this for me and see whether or not I'm losing my mind completely because I can't get anyone else to care. It seems really bad. And... I don't know what to do with the fact that I found this. So James, you're describing a system that is obviously a system of peer reviewed uh, research that seems to be very, very broken, correct? Meaning the the, the general understanding for the vast majority of folks uh, is that peer review is some type of rigorous process that kind of vets much of this. But it turns out that there's not much vetting uh, going on. And, and by the way, you, that, that, that's, I mean, and that's, that's what peer review can potentially possibly do. Some of the stuff you're describing right now is, of course, stuff that peer review wouldn't be able to catch, right? Meaning if somebody's changing, oh, yes. yeah, absolutely. changing numbers and... and, and absolutely, yeah. yeah. So, so but, but, but beyond that, you, I mean, you're, you're describing a number of different papers um, that, you know, you did some data sleuthing and, and, and sorted this stuff out. Uh, there's some contextual stuff. Um, just, just, just stuff like, you know, A plus B doesn't equal C. I mean, at a very basic level, there doesn't appear, appear to be much, uh, much, much looking under the covers at all. There's just a bunch of rubber stamping. Well, 
yeah, there's a there's a bunch of there's a bunch of qualifications to that, but you have a central point that's definitely correct. Uh, the first qualification is an awful lot of peer review is good, and a lot of bad review is diluted by the good peer review. If you have three to five reviewers, next time this is something that I, I always ask people to do when they ask me about peer review. If you, you a lot of the time, I, I think it's normal in the social sciences to have three reviewers. So it's sort of a engineering conferences, uh, sometimes it's more people writing shorter reviews um, for really specific topics. A lot of the time you can have one or two uh, reviewers and the editor writing a really long review. It depends how much they care, etc., etc. But you will have reviews in your inbox. Read the reviews that you wrote and read the reviews that the other people wrote. I got one of these at the end of last week. I spent a long time looking at a paper and the results of the book, but it's, it's comparing one uh, one version of doing ECG measurement to another version of doing ECG measurement as a measurement environment. Um, it was it was kind of scary. The, they they found they found some things that are if you get into the sort of hardware end of things problems. Like oh wow okay well I don't know this but these things are really widely used. I went I looked it up and okay I wrote a proper review. Like, no, this, it's not really right for this journal etc cetera, etc. Cetera. You got to change this change this. What does the editor think etc. Series of qualifications and I wrote quite a long review because it was a little bit scary as a paper. I wanted to make sure I was okay. Um, and then I saw the reviews from the other people. One very good and completely different to mine and the other one was like this this paper am be good. Paper am do great. G great words, the heart, thing in order. Cheese, blueberries, I have a hat, thank you so much for playing. That was the, it, it was only very slightly better than that. That's a mild parody. Read the reviews that other people are writing. And then you can start to understand how even in uh, journals you wouldn't necessarily take reviews from in the first place or places where researcher X is great friends with editor Y, et cetera, et cetera. You can see how some of this stuff gets to perpetuate. A, a, a lot of people, another experience to watch out for is journal shopping. You're probably familiar with this, right? Have you ever had the experience where you've reviewed something and said, oh, no, 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 there's a series of systematic problems here. You need to look at things like A through K here. <laughs> if you look at all of those, maybe we can look at treating this as a piece of research rather than a piece of fanciful, fanciful lunacy. Okay, cool, fair enough. A lot of the time that paper is bounced and occasionally you will see it published without any of those corrections made in another outlet. And that's what, that's what journal shopping does. It's easier to just go, ah, no, those reviewers there are mean and or unfair. Like they owe you something and you, there's, no, there's no point actually improving it. When you, when you stick all of these things together, I mean, it, it doesn't become sort of, I'm, I'm not really an alarmist when it comes to peer reviewers completely. I had too many good experiences of things being made better and errors being caught to be an alarmist about how it's unnecessary or problematic or how it needs to stop, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but there are some really serious structural problems with how it's done and with what it turns out. But that's not the bad part. The bad part is that they're really old they're really old there's a paper from oh i think it was the year i was born showing my age here uh 1982 one of the authors was ceci i believe c-e-c-i it's a classic now they took a series of really fancy papers uh peters peters and ceci 1982 um I don't know if pe people still read this anymore. They took a bunch of psychology papers from very fancy institutions, changed out the names of the institutions for things like the Tri-State Area Institute of Integrated Wellness, which just sounds like three people in caftans on a hill, right? So they did that. Swap these papers, uh, the, swap the institution of these papers out and then sent the papers to different journals where immediately they were treated completely differently. <laughs> When they turned up, like, no, you, you must be joking. In a caftan on a hill? Absolutely not, sir. You will not publish in my venue. And it is, it is kind of a, 
it's, it's a very straightforward, it's a very powerful effect and a very straightforward indictment of, are you assessing the context that comes with the information or the information? Now, okay, maybe that's not so bad most of the time, but the, I would say that the real problem is, is that paper was in 1982. And you still have people arguing about whether or not blind review is a good idea, whether or not signing reviews are, are good ideas, whether or not you can be publicly identified as a reviewer, whether or not your review survives with the paper. So if there's anything that you really, really should have noticed at the time, you can be identified as the person who didn't figure it out. Now, the component part of that is something where that, that applies more broadly everywhere. And that's the fact that I think we need to be more forgiving when it comes to, yeah, you've got a paper attracted. Let's assume you made a mistake and not kick you down a hill, right? Oh, you reviewed something and you failed to find an error. Yeah. People make mistakes. That's the point. Yeah. That should be pointed out, but it shouldn't be some kind of black mark that is applied to your soul. You should be allowed to, it should be easier to admit to making mistakes. It should be easier to remove things from a permanent record. It should be easier to be identified as having made a mistake. And it should be less of a kind of mark of Cain. There's a tremendous amount of interest in the, in the collective scientific endeavor about putting the next idea in order, making progress, doing the next thing, etc. There is nowhere near enough and much, much less collective interest paid to, is the foundation that we're building on any good? And if it isn't, can it be updated in real time? We do have the internet now. We are allowed to annotate things. Publication does not have to mean a permanent granite encased record of things that can never be changed. It's because there's, there's some kind of fetishization that goes on with the idea of progress and progress meaning publication, and that's it, full stop, end of story. And the, the kind of backlash through the collective interest in the methodology of science in general is what's been starting in the last few years. And yeah. it's supremely overdue, and I'm very happy to be right. part of it. Yeah, I don't no, know it, if I lost focus there for a second. I probably <laughs> that tends no, to. No, 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 no. It, it, it's, it, you know, so what you're describing uh, is this type of a corrective salve that is being, it's not exactly a soothing bomb, it's a little bit of a burn that's being applied. It's so incredibly important. We had Brian Nosek on here, um, uh, you know, 10 or 15 episodes ago. I, I had to familiarize myself with your podcast. And so I had to choose two episodes to listen to. And the first one that I listened to was your episode with Brian Nosek. He, he is our Buddha. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, that was the one I was going to choose. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was, yeah, and he's, yeah, and, and he's done such an important, such important work um, in terms of trying to replicate a lot of these, a lot of studies, and 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 really, I think moving things in, in a in a in a way uh, that is productive. Um, mm -hmm. it, so, it, I, I'd like to think that at least. Some some folks like to say that well this is a problem that's um, limited to the social sciences like you know the social sciences tried to make themselves empiric they tried to apply statistical methods and arrive yeah. at values and kind of make uh -huh. themselves like the physicists who you know and 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 this is where uh, this is where most of the problem is is that you know is trying to trying to trying to quantify things things within the social sciences would you do you think that this is a special problem within the social sciences and when i say social sciences i'm including things that really affect us in medicine um mm -hmm. uh you know healthcare policy and economics um uh, certainly you know is, is part of that but do you think that that group uh, has that grouping has a has a special problem hmm. i got a question for you first Am I allowed to swear on your podcast, Anish? Ab absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> because this is radio, you can't see the smile the man provides. Oh, that is, that is a captivating smile, sir. Um, that's bullshit. Sorry, that, it, 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 it really is. And the idea that um, 
So if that's bullshit, then the question is, um, the, 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 the common theme that runs through this is what, James? Meaning, why, why, are, we having these, why are we having these problems throughout, the, throughout research, whether it be you know, uh, biomedicine or e- economics or you know, psycho- uh, I, I think or when it what? comes, I would put that in perspective for you. Yeah, obviously, there's, um, there's, we, we do not have time and should not get into the specifics of the problems in each individual field and subfield. Um, about which I could bore you quite literally into a coma. Um, there are problems within economics. There are problems within ecology. There are problems within forensic science. These are the ones that come immediately to mind yeah. on an exhaustive yeah. list. There's very definitely problems in forensic science. Um, there are problems in sociology. There are a ton of problems in biomedicine and biology. Yeah. Um, there are problems within the hard sciences that I don't understand sufficiently to talk about them. Um, I have to listen to clever people tell me when it comes to things like that. Um, why, why is there more interest in psychology? Uh, or, or, but, but, uh, t- take, take, the, take why you think that this happens across all fields. So you don't, so, so you don't, you don't think that this is something that's limited to the the uh, the social sciences uh, okay. and and I and I and I agree with you uh, in part because my eyes are opened by um, uh, Daryl Francis, a cardiologist in uh, the UK. Daryl through... Francis is gangster, and yes. I love him. Yeah, and he he went through a uh, I would say some fairly landmark papers that, that I mean I rested on in terms of uh, practice of cardiology mm-hmm. and pointed out some incredibly interesting things in the group that was putting those papers out and very similar. Yeah, I, I, I remember that, that filtered through into the people yeah. generally. Yeah, skeptical yeah, yeah. And so I tend to, so I tend to agree with, right. So I tend to agree with you that it's not, uh, it's not limited to the social sciences and this is, this is, this is everywhere, but, but, but why is it happening? What's, what's the, what's the underlying uh, motivation uh, or, you know, the underlying uh, reason for this that happens? Of, all of, of what is it built? Uh, a, a whole, a whole lot of things. Um, essentially, we have a, a system of putting information in order that was parameterized initially in about the 16th century. What an article is, how it goes to a place of publication, how it is communicated, and what it consists of are all very, very old ideas. Uh, it's become increasingly useful recently to release things like the data that you used, uh, which might help you determine whether or not you're talking about something that's any good. The code that you use to analyze the data that goes with the paper. Uh, uh, additional material that might throw analyses into a, uh, a, more, a, a more kind of a understandable light. The, the, the idea that uh, you're, you're allowed to have a method section that's as long as it needs to be rather than pretending that we only have so much space in our magazine, which does not exist anymore. That's where word limits are from. It's the idea that it needs to be printed in something and it's a certain size and a certain amount of it has to be advertising for hemorrhoid cream and uh, the, 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 the idea that you need to skimp on the detail when it turns out how you actually did it. Not everyone has to read that, but it probably has to be there along with the data and the code. The idea that you should make a commitment to whether or not you had the right ideas for analysis in the first place. Otherwise, you can try every analysis and the report the one you like. Right. All of these things which are coming under increased focus, especially in since about probably 2012, 13, I think we've really started to pick up. Um, in psychology, it was in the wake of the rather hilarious Daryl Bam episode, which I'm not sure everyone's collectively aware of, but uh, there's a very good piece by Dan Engber and Slate about that. If you Google Dan Engber Slate Bam, you can, you can have a good laugh uh, whenever you get around to listening to this. So, All of those things are designed to address these problems, but why have they kind of metastasized as problems in the first place? 
because we have a collective amount of pressure that is applied to us as, I won't say scientists, but rather researchers. How should we understand whether or not you are good, what you've done? And the answer that we collectively settled on is that you should put as many words in order in as many outlets as possible for as long as possible. And into, into that environment, we do not value the quality of the answer as much as the quality of the outlet into which we are allowed to put the answer. And how many answers are given? It is something that, that in other, context, uh, other, other contexts, no person in any household or business or nonprofit organization would, would ever really accept. It's like saying, I'd like to buy a lovely loaf of bread from the artisan bakery. And someone says, well, how about I shoot you with a compressed air cannon with 50 loaves of Wonder White? There, that's, that's just as good. Um, it, it, it's, 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 very, it's very vogue to blame incentives for these things, but they are very difficult to look past. So the, you're it, talking about academic currency being publishing. And I mean, your, your, your grant money comes from that, your, you rise in terms of up to professorship or whatnot. Yeah. yeah. So you the have grant, to The grant system itself is a whole new world of hurt we should probably not open up, but that's very, very far from opaque and straightforward. Right. I think you're correct, James. Uh, let me uh, interject. Michelle, here. you're there. How are you? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. I was quietly listening in the background. But I think you're right. Um, a, a couple of years ago, I was reading um, or, or listening to an interview of, I can't remember his name, but he's one of the founders of the new uh, preprint platforms. And he was talking about the peer review uh, crisis, if you will. And he was commenting of, on the fact that uh, sort of uh, uh, peer review uh, in a systematic way is relatively recent. Uh, you know, maybe post World War II, 1960s, even maybe 1970s. About 65, that, yes. Yeah, that prior to that, really, um, uh, editors would just cho choose to publish. But but I think what the difference was that in those days. You know, I mean, before the before World War II, if you will, the, the who consumed science. It was primarily a, a small community of scientists, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the paper, the platform was for them to, I mean, so they were all peer reviewing, essentially the paper, right? The fact that it was published didn't mean much because it was, it was directed to a small community. What happened is that now, I mean, after World War II, both in the United States and in Europe and across the West, you have this massive funding for research, mm. this avalanche of, funding and money and and science becomes a lot more impersonal i mean you have a lot of money you have a look you know academic careers that did not exist exist before and and uh, there's uh, there's a problem because now all this all these publications as you said become the currency for you know academic careers and and also they need to be somehow um, uh, filtered, but there's no good way of filtering them. So you, you have a peer review process that is really quite imperfect, and and you have a bubble. I mean, don't, are are we in a scientific bubble? Have we been in a scientific bubble for the last fifty, sixty years? Um, what what? How does that strike you as as uh, as a thought? Uh, the, the problem, the problem with the bubble is that there's there's nothing in the metaphor that's a kind of a middle ground between like hard ground versus a bubble. A bubble pops and then is gone. Um, you know, a, a hard surface is hard. I think of it a little bit more like it's spongier than we'd like. That it will compress further than we think when we try and put weight on it. I've, I've described it in the past as having as like a lot of scientific endeavor has stage two methodological cancer. Now, a lot of things at stage two are reasonably treatable, right? I mean, it obviously right. it depends. It depends on the individual condition, but in general, it's it's something it's something like that. And of course, uh, the, the, when you have an interview like this, you might think, well, it's all hopeless. We should all just take up basket weaving and live in the sea. But no, we probably shouldn't. Um, it's more like, what, what, is, what is your response to it? How should you react? How should you understand it? How should you use this information going forwards? Um, I, 
there, there are elements of things that will have to be corrected. I would like to see less individual pieces of research published. I would like saner timelines for the things that we all collectively try to do. Um, the, the problem, of course, comes into the fact that if there is a, a small amount of money and a large amount of researchers, and while the money itself in any external sense is enormous, the amount of people who would like to use it to find things out is enormous. Yeah. Um, <laughs> at, which point, at which point in time we, we find ourselves in the present situation. Is the problem that we have too many postdocs, that we have too many PhDs? I mean, is that, I mean, I don't know how to put a finer point on that. I mean, do we have too many academics? Uh, this, that's actually a really, really difficult question to answer. The one thing that I am sure of is that we have far less preparation for the people who are academics to not do it than any other goddamn thing. We know that somewhere between, depending on your area, somewhere between about half to about 19 out of 20, people who go through a PhD program will not end up doing research in the career in which they have got an advanced graduate research degree. So in some places it's really straightforward, in other places it's borderline impossible. I think from the, there's an, an old infographic about this that scared the hell out of everyone in Science Mag a couple of years ago. I think the, the full, like, uh, full tenured professor is one in 200 of graduating PhDs. What is being done? You can graduate as many people as you like. You learn external skills when you do a research degree. You learn to put numbers in order. You learn to read information quickly. You learn to, how to understand complicated things. You learn to write well under pressure. You learn a lot of skills that are identifiable as useful. And increasingly, you learn to code. You learn to write and interpret programming languages to do useful things. You learn to talk to engineers. You learn to solve problems. None of the, no, no employer in the world listens to a list like that and goes, oh, well, that's completely useless. No, you, there's a, an awful lot of, they may be domain specific, but the skills themselves don't care. Now, uh, about those people, what is being done? And the answer to that is very little. So on that basis, and you say, well, are we making too many junior scientists? Are too many early career researchers should we be graduating less people? There's obviously a collective expectation, if that's the case, and that's definitely the case, there's obviously a collective expectation that maybe it'll, maybe it'll work out for me, maybe it'll like the path forward. Still now, even in the world where it's as, as common as mud to just sort of drop everything and go and work for a startup, it, it, is, it is as common as you can possibly imagine that everyone thinks it's all just essentially going to work out because everyone they ever know who is within their field of research is going to proceed gently forward to do that. Um, psychologists don't generally think that because they understand what survivorship bias is. <laughs> Another benefit of the social sciences, huh? Yeah, Matt, look, I, I, don't, I don't have a hard answer yeah. about how to, how, to, that. how to handle something like so that. Uh, it, I, so it has to be it has to be said that um, a lot of this work uh, that's been that's been done by you folks um, has been done from the platform of social media. Um, Hell yeah! You you know this was not I mean the amount of uh, influence you've had um, uh, by blogging about these things um, uh, by getting folks to read it uh, on on your blogs is probably way more impactful than I don't know how many countless constipated editorials written by, you know, God knows, you know, some key opinion leader somewhere. Um, and I think that's an incredibly, incredibly important point. So, I mean, I think oh, yeah. um, social yeah. media, you know, there was just a, there was just a bunch of, uh, I think, cardiologist, journal, some journal editors that wrote a bunch of stuff about, you know, being, you know, we've got to watch out for fake news. And part of watching out for fake news is, uh, is uh, making sure you, you know, read the respected journals. And, you know, uh, the interesting thing is, is that the, reading the respected journals is not necessarily um, a, a protection uh, from being misled. And so, you know, the, the hopeful way forward that I think you'll agree with is that 
there are folks like uh, there are folks like you, and there's a growing number of folks in other fields as well now um, who aren't sitting in ivory towers necessarily, um, who are sitting in um, small rooms in cold Boston, who are, who are kind of looking, who are, you know, petting their cat and uh, looking at looking closely at a uh, at papers in these various right. fields to kind of wearing, point out these, these wearing papers. my nicest shirt. <laughs> Exactly right. Exactly. Don't right. read that out on the air. <laughs> so, but 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 is that so? Hopefully, that that's a little bit of a you know resistance or whatnot that's developing, and that'll hopefully make us all um, better for it. But yeah. is the institutional way forward? I, I have to, I have trouble believing that you know that's that's necessarily something that's going to be able to be scalable. Um, I think I, I wonder if. Institution so speaking, that you know, there's things that these folks need to do that we that folks like you know, you're, you, I mean, you're a leader in this area now. Um, they need to push for in terms of, you know, having professional peer reviewers, and, and part of becoming a professional peer reviewer is going to a class that you and Nick Jones and uh, Jordan and uh, Tim give on how to kind of spot these spot these basic errors, so that you know, you, you at least catch the the dumb fraudsters. Actually, before before you answer that question, James, uh, just for clarification, sure. Uh, because I, I I'm not as familiar as Anish is with the, with the work that you've done. The tools that you described um, to analyze, uh, uh, you know, summary descriptive statistics, um, are these available? I mean, can they be used by? Uh, you know, have you put them? Can people use them to oh, to, to, to yes. screen to screen sort of uh, absolutely and wouldn't journal editors themselves be happy to use them or have somebody dedicated on their editorial team to apply those? Well, I I uh, would I would sincerely hope so. I've had stories of people doing that. I I don't know how a lot of editors most most editors I know are, are, are more more coffee than man at this point. So I don't know if they have time to take on extra tasks like that. But not only it look not only are the though both of those available as preprints, but the code is available and Jordan has a web portal where you can do both of them in a web browser. Um, Nick built an R Shiny app where you can do that. I work in MATLAB a lot of the time because I'm a, a dirty old man who can't update his practices properly, but the code is available for both of these things. Um, also, likewise, the description of how you can, you can do, especially Grim on the, the back of an envelope. Um, we have an Excel spreadsheet that people use for Grim that we made ages ago. Yeah, there's tools. We, I, we, we couldn't, besides taking out Facebook ads, I'm not sure how I could give them away anymore. Yeah. Right. Absolutely, man. This is not, this is not closed culture stuff. We are yeah, all, right. That's what, that's very, what I thought. That's what I thought. I yeah. just wanted to, to have that. And I'm, I, I, I would imagine, I'm, I'm surprised. Well, I don't know how, actually, I don't know how to anticipate the reaction of the journals to tools like this being available, whether they will well, embrace them. Yeah. Or, so that's, a, that's one of the disappointing things I thought well, from the Cornell response to OneSync was, was that there was, no, there was no real mention of the work that um, you folks did. And, by, and, and I don't think that, and, and you've mentioned in your blogs, I believe, that the folks at Cornell never really contacted any, formally contacted anyone of, of you, correct? Not a single muttered word. Yeah, so it's a it's a real puzzle in terms of why that is. You know, that's um, not that's not a that's not a puzzle at not all. A, puzzle. A, a university passed a so that it's run by people whose job is managing large organizations and shuffling around huge amounts of money. Is not in the business that is committed to scientific integrity. They're not interested in error detection. A problem has arisen. I think when it started, they retained the the the, the like the OJPR firm or something like that. And they, their their whole response to this is as a business problem. They are not interested in the specific details. They could not be less interested in what we've actually done. They're interested in the outcomes. What journal yelled at who for what degree and what kind of media coverage is this getting? And that is it. Yeah, scientific, I recall. Scientific integrity is our job. Their job is managing uh, whether or not they see an 8% dip in enrollment or if uh, alumni stop giving money to the Carrots and Children Foundation, something, something. Right, right. And, right? and you, mentioned, you mentioned the fact that the Wansink stuff came to a head uh, in in part at Cornell because JAMA 
uh, you know, uh, started asking a lot of questions. So when a major journal starts asking yeah. questions, I guess that that's that's when maybe universities start trying to cut bait and cut their losses, if you will. Yeah, well, that they, like I said, that had nothing to do with us whatsoever. But I would be hugely surprised if mm -hmm. that wasn't a central, pivotal moment right. in all of that getting handled, because that is not those that that's 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 big time. You know, right, right. but the editor writes to you and says, everything that you've published in our journal group, I require immediate justification not to throw it all in the fire. Right, right. And some, some version of that happened. That's obviously not an accurate description and there's probably no fire, but there, there was, there was some kind of rapprochement that was only really possible with either uh, a full explanation of how everything had gone wrong or some kind of, admission of problems and it obviously all went very badly and then what happened happened yeah so here's the thing james um doesn't it by being so open about how uh you can catch some of this stuff right um, mm -hmm. aren't you worried that the real good fraudsters you know it's always the the notion always is that you don't catch the pink panther you catch the dumb criminals right you catch the ones <laughs> that are really stupid um and so, you know, are you not going to push, are you not going to, are you not making the criminals better by, uh, by kind of openly demonstrating this? So you know what's going to happen, right? The folks that are really, really good are going to make sure they get James Heather's Sprite app. They're going to punch their, once they're done with their whatever uh, data, they're going to punch it into Sprite, make sure it fits and then get it out, right? Yeah. Um... Look, that's, that's, that's a very good question, but I'm, I'm not... These, these have all actually been very good questions. I think you've done a, a, an excellent job on getting the background together for this. Um, I'm not even slightly concerned about that for a variety of reasons. Um, one is the fact that the historical record of science already exists. It can't be removed or updated. That's something that I was complaining about 20 minutes ago. It can't be removed or updated or changed. It is the way it is. And the mistakes that have already been made are in there and will remain there until the end of time. And we haven't even come close to scratching the surface of all the things that could actually be investigated. So in the terms of the collective body of knowledge, it's being slightly updated, even though there's more, more papers published than ever before, it's 2 million a year or something. Now I'm not sure of the exact figures. Um, we're still not coming close to scratching the surface of being able to look through all of it. And you can't go back in time and remove all the, the terrible dishonest things that you've done previously. They are now there. They cannot be redacted. Right. It's not photos of you and your mistress in one single brown paper envelope. It exists in thousands and thousands of servers all over the world. It's yeah. been downloaded yeah. a million times. Yeah. The secret, the secret is out there. Right. The other thing is, if someone really wants to be dishonest and is really maximally intelligent about doing it, you're not going to get caught with a simple numerical test. Right. If you know what you're doing when it comes to the, the possible dishonesty that you could deploy, there's no question that something like that's ever going to find you. Yeah. That's the scary part about it. Yeah. is the fact that I mean, you, you, I've told people this many, many times. Like you have to understand the extent of the collective problem. If we just catch people who can't add, there are dishonest people who can add. In fact, that's probably most of them. How should they be detected? They will not be detected through these methods. But the fact that something can be this bad and exist in perpetuity or something like it is the indicative part. And the more times this happens, it's, look, it, 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 another thing to consider is directly relevant to that. If you look at any decent survey of research behavior, you get sort of 30, 35% of people going, yes, I have done one of those regular everyday questionable research practices. And then you ask them, have you ever, uh, have you ever fabricated or misrepresented data? Have you ever done any fraud? Have just made it up from scratch? Have you ever plagiarized anything? Have you ever done something really bad? Yeah. The vast majority of people say no. Now, dishonest people are probably going to lie to you if you ask them if they were dishonest. But the whole point is, there's a very small amount of people doing really bad stuff. And there's a very large body of people doing kind of 
regularly methodologically problematic stuff. And you're only catching a small percentage of the small percentage of the people. But what does it say about the research record collectively if you can find five? Say there were five Brian Wonsinks in ish. Yeah. Yeah. What would what would that mean? Column ink would be spilled, pens would be thrown. People would people working in newsrooms would stay up nights to try and figure out what was happening next. Science writers all over the world would rub their hands together. But that's just five. What if there was ten? Yeah. What if there was fifty? What if there was one in every major field and subfield in the entire pantheon of scientific endeavor? And they could be found. Now, at that point in time, as I said before, maybe there's a hundred times as many people doing research that is problematic for different reasons. Right. Maybe they're not doing fraud. Maybe it's just sort of regularly bad. Maybe it's just a matter of process and they don't know. Maybe they're perfectly honest, nice people who are good to their pets. But what conversation will be had when we find all the dumb, crazy, egregious fraud? Right. That's the thing that's happening. That's the thing that's going to happen. We will have to talk about right. this. We right. cannot pretend it doesn't happen. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, well, James, this has been fantastic. I'm, uh, one point is that, you know, we've, we've moved in, in the medical literature from a place where um, in our highest, most esteemed journals, we used to publish case series of interesting uh, patients, right? We'd have yeah. a case series of 25 patients with this really interesting uh, finding and, and we would describe the natural history of what happened to them. Uh -huh. and, and the thought is, is that we are now so much better in 2019 because we have thousand patient trials, um, uh, either randomized controlled trials or not, or observational trials that, 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 that employ statistical methodology that most of us are clinicians are reading, have no idea how to recreate. And we don't have no idea what, 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 you know, what exactly uh, they mean. And, you know, I think it's an important message that, uh, we have to be really careful of, may, of of jumping to the conclusion that we are somehow in a better place empirically, um, or in a better place in terms of finding the truth. I should say, um, just because we have uh, we have you know we've created these uh, new metrics, if you will, from where medicine has um, uh, come from. Meaning, uh, so so you know we, we have to really do a much better job, I think, than what we have been doing. I think the vast majority of us read the abstract. We assume that because it's in the New England Journal of Medicine or the Annals of Internal Medicine or JAMA that, you know, this is, this is something that's been vetted and mm -hmm. we're, all, we're all busy and we just accept it. We apply it to our patients and move on. And we all have to understand, I think, that, um, uh, that, that we need to be much more skeptical uh, of what we're, what we're reading, certainly. Um, and then the other point is that, you know, every time, every cardiology fellow, there's a, you know, cardiology fellowship is three years, internal medicine is three mm -hmm. years before that, it takes six years to become a cardiologist. Yeah. And every single one of us is under some type of pressure from our program director, or from oh God, yes. Yes, applying absolutely. to cardiology to do some research project. And the way it works is that, you know, we are given two months to do research and write up some abstract and send it to somebody. <laughs> and, you know, I, I, I'm thinking, and I hope some cardiology fellows are listening, that it would be far, far more useful um, to, to spend some time understanding uh, some of the simple stuff that James and the group have done, whether we're talking about Grimm, whether we're talking about the Sprite analysis, and looking back at some of these uh, papers, looking back at many of the papers in cardiology and seeing whether or not there are ir irregularities to be found. Because as you know, as, as, as James is suggesting and explicitly saying, um, you know, what, what, what we're talking about is probably just the tip of the iceberg. And there's a lot of stuff in the historical record that uh, is uh, waiting to be found. Yeah, man. Look, uh, this, the, the, the idea of, I mean, it's, it's fanciful, the idea that they give you two months to go out and do yeah. Go, go, go and go and do a research You make it sound like I go to the <laughs> shops and get a dozen eggs, yeah. you know? Yeah. It's like there was a, the Monty Python sketch years ago where it was, uh, it, it was about how to do things. And, the, and it was like, how to play the flute? Well, you <laughs> blow in this end and you move your fingers up and down the outside. 
right? Yeah. <laughs> Come yeah. back next yeah. week for the, the, the leader of the People's Republic of China on how to rule 900 million people. Yeah, yeah. yeah like everything's perfectly straightforward. If there was a way you could collectively contribute to a larger project where it was the, the parameterization of how the observations were made was covered somehow, yeah. There yeah. Are, that would be that would be a lot more use. But yeah, yeah so would so would learning to be not not skeptical in the sense that you shouldn't believe everything you see, but learning to flip your perspective on right. a piece of research where instead of saying, okay, this is opening it and saying, right, I'm starting at the method section, justify yeah. yourself to me. Right, right, now, right. And, 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 and a lot right. of papers will meet that standard. Right, right. There's and the point you made is so right, right. And the point you made is so important because I think a lot of clinicians are, are get so lost and you know they just they don't even read the method section. It's like what the heck? I don't understand that. Right. But but I think what you said is so important because you, James, as smart as you are, um, are are unable to give the real world context that every that that every cardiologist has. Every cardiologist, clinical cardiologist, who's taking care of patients who's sitting in a hospital. Yeah. has a massive amount of subject matter expertise that is oh, going to yes. be able to look into trials in a way that, you know, some expert statistician, some expert computational biologist is, uh, is not going to have. So, oh, yeah. no, so take heart. But James, this has been fantastic. I'm sorry we've uh, run a little bit over. Usually we're 45 minutes to an hour, but... Um, that's okay. perfectly okay. I, t I take that as a kind of a collective mark that I'm vaguely interesting. Although <laughs> yeah. It could just be the fact that it's real hard to stop me talking. <laughs> <laughs> really wonderful. I, we, we, we may have you back on at some point in the, past, in the future, so I hope, you'll, uh, I hope you'll agree. But thanks again for coming on, James. Really fantastic. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. It's nice to meet you both. Yep. Thank, Thank you. you.